Chapter Seven of Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter Seven. A live hero, the retrograde army movement. The villain Walker was returned to his lonely cell. Lieutenant Wells was released from all restraint. The soldiers dispersed to talk about the strange turn events had taken. But the center of attraction was Nettleton. He was seated in front of the Hinton tent. Close beside him was Miss Hayward, kneeling and gazing mournfully into his face, while Alabamo, Wells, the general, Nettie Morton, Sally Long, the officers who had composed the court-martial, the especial friends of the parties, and as many of the soldiers as could get within hearing distance, were earnestly listening to the narrative of the bodyguard. Nettleton went on to relate his meeting the rebel scouts, and the fact of their having informed him that Hayward had only been wounded and conveyed toward Wilson's Creek by a party attached to the command of Lieutenant Colonel Price. The reader will mark the distinction between Lieutenant Colonel Price, who was a ruffian guerrilla, and had broken his parole three times, an act repudiated by all honest soldiers of either army, and General Sterling Price, who, although a rebel, always had acted in a gentlemanly and humane manner to all prisoners of war. After listening to the story of William, the general drew from his pocket the note which had been found at the Ozark Bridge, signed Charles Campbell. This note must have been written but a few moments before the fight took place. The date would be just two days after Hayward had received the assassin's stroke, giving about the proper time for the wounded man to be carried from Grand Prairie to Ozark, at which latter place Lieutenant Colonel Price had formed a temporary camp. The writer spoke of a wounded man in a boat, and against whom Price had had an especial spite. This confirmed the conviction that Hayward had been taken thither for the especial gratification of Price's fiendish propensities. The note also said that he bore the marks of a captain's rank, and, in his delirium, spoke of Net, which might have referred to the young lady, Nettie Morton, whom he possibly might have seen in the distance upon the bank as the boat neared the spot where she was standing, or, as seemed more probable, that the wounded captain was calling upon Nettleton. At all events, it was decided that the person of whom Charles Campbell had written was no other than Captain Hayward. It is true, he was still almost insensible from his wounds, and was near the camp of his most unforgiving enemy, but there was a friend at hand, an enemy in arms, but a friend to the wounded and helpless soldier, as are all true men, and he had written that he would save him. "'Why should we not hope?' asked Alabama, as she clasped her friend, Mamie, in her arms. "'And why should we not act?' cried Wells, as he clutched the hilt of his sword. "'Yes, we will act,' yelled Nettleton, as he sprung up and appeared ready for instant departure. "'Go, William!' Follow the stream from Ozark until you find some trace, and then return to us, said Miss Hayward, eagerly. Nettleton turned his gaze upon Miss Sally for a moment, and then, as if ashamed of his hesitation or of his weakness in exhibiting any symptoms of love, he started with a bound, exclaiming, I'm off. Good-bye, all. He had proceeded, however, but a few steps, when he halted, and scratching his head, his countenance assumed a most woeful expression, and his eyes rolled wildly about. "'What is the matter, William?' asked Wells. "'Got to go the other way,' was the melancholy reply. "'Why so? Oh, just a bit of fun, that's all.' "'Well, tell us what it is, Nettleton.' "'I can't. It will break her heart,' he replied, pointing to Sally. "'So it would, William, if anything dreadful should happen to you,' replied Miss Long as she dropped her eyes to the ground. "'There, didn't I tell you so?' replied the faithful servant, his mouth gaping and his eyes expanding. "'William,' asked Wells, "'do you really love Miss Long?' "'Love her, Lieutenant? That ain't no name for it. 
Why, can't you see yourself that she's the sweetest darn skit? No, I mean the nicest critter in the world, except in Miss Mamie. And does she love you, William? asked Alabamo, smiling, in spite of herself, at the tableau and acting before her. Of course I do, replied Sally, proudly and triumphantly, as if a victory had been won. There, there. Do you hear that? Now don't you pity me? I believe I am the most ugly cuss in the world. I never thought anybody would ever love me. And now I find out the gal as I wants most is just the one as does love me. Oh, Lordy, I'm sick, I do believe. All right, Wells responded with a smile. All right. Not by a blasted sight, sir. Did you think it all right when you loved Miss Mamie and thought you had to swing? What? You talk in riddles. Explain. I've got to be hung, he roared, but whether with pain or delight, none could tell. Why, you didn't have anything to do with hurting the captain, cried Sally, as she advanced toward her beloved. Nettleton gazed at her an instant with a most singular expression, and then replied, Miss Long, never let suspicion cross that delicate boat mind of yours. But like the true turtle dove, put your trust in the uprighteousness of your future lord and master, what is to be hanged all on account of the first time you wrapped them delicate arms of yourn around my long neck. William, what do you mean by being hanged? asked the general. Nettleton then went on to relate the agreement he had made with Price, to return and undergo the punishment which was about to be inflicted upon him when that general interfered. He declared his intention of returning at once, as his furlough had run out, and as a man of honor he must return. "'And do you really intend to return?' asked the general. "'Of course I do,' replied William, with something of scorn and much of pride in his tones. "'William, think for a moment. You are now safe. You are with one who loves you, and with whom you can be happy. Why will you return?' "'General, don't argue this point with me. I said I would come back, and darn me if I don't. Nettleton started, after having shook the hand of his friends. Stay a moment, Nettleton, said the general. I have a letter from General Price with regard to you. Nettleton paused and listened, as the commander, opening the envelope, read, Camp near Cassville, November 12, 1861. To General Blank. Greeting. A prisoner of war was released from our camp, and permitted to return to Springfield on the ninth. It was at first thought that he was a spy, as he had been seen in and near our camp before, and he was about to suffer death upon the scaffold. When I saw and questioned him, I became convinced that he was no spy, but a faithful servant and friend, searching for his captain, whom he loved. I ordered his release. I gave him a parole of honor. He promised to return that the sentence of the drumhead court could be carried into effect upon him, after he had given the evidence he possessed, which he declared was necessary to save an innocent man. I admire his truthfulness. Should he be determined to return, of which I have no doubt, you will read this letter, which releases William Nettleton from any further obligation. He will remain with his friends and be happy. Signed by the A.A.A.G. For the Commander, Price. The effect upon the gallant fellow of the reading of this letter was somewhat singular. He stood for a moment gaping around upon the spectators as if he had been caught in some mean act. Then a smile came over his face like sunlight creeping over a rugged mountain top. Soon his countenance looked like a newly risen sun fairly blazing with blushes. Then with a wild whoop, which rung out like a signal, he sprung into the air, rattled his feet together, and once on earth again bounded off like a great moose for the nearest thicket, where to indulge his feelings without restraint. The crowd dispersed in good humor, to talk over the strange events of an hour. If one heart was happier than all, it was that of poor Mamie, whose joy at the proven innocence of her friend and lover was too intense for words. In her heart a new hope had also arisen, that her dear brother, would again be restored to her arms, and thus fill up the cup of her blessings to the brim. 
It had been decided by the friends of Hayward that a search for the captain would be useless, but it was hoped that Charles Campbell would give some information which would lead to his discovery, or that Fall Leaf, a celebrated Indian scout, who had now been absent many days on the very line of the enemy's march, would return with some tidings by which the actions of the captain's anxious friends should be governed. The Army of the Mississippi, having passed from Fremont's command to that of General Hunter, had been ordered to fall back from Springfield, in two columns, the one by the way of the Osage and Warsaw to Tipton, Missouri, on the line of the main Pacific Road, and the other by way of Lebanon on the main road between Springfield and Rolla, the southwestern branch of the same road. Each place, in distance from Springfield, was about 125 miles. The march of the division to which Captain Hayward's friends were attached, which was under the command of the brave Siegel, was commenced on the morning of November 20th. That division formed the rear of the entire army. It proceeded by the Rolla Turnpike. Nothing of note transpired until the division was ascending the rolling hill about two miles before reaching Lebanon, when a horseman, his face and head streaming with blood, rode rapidly along the lines, exclaiming, Fight in front! Fight in front! He halted for no one to question him, but kept on his way. No guns were heard, and many expressed the opinion that it must be a strange fight. But, as a necessary precaution, the infantrymen were halted, their pieces loaded, and bayonets fixed. The artillery was charged, and flags unfurled. As the troops ascended the hill, and looked in vain for a foe, the question was asked, Where is the fight? This was soon settled, as another messenger rode up and informed the general that a party or squadron of rebel cavalry, numbering about four hundred, had attacked a little band of home guards of about thirty, which had been collected in a valley some twenty miles south of Lebanon, on the main road in a place called Bohannon Mills Valley. Most of the thirty home guard had been killed, wounded, or dispersed by the guerrillas. Then all families in that vicinity known to entertain Union proclivities were visited at the dead of night. Murder and arson was the cry. Many poor creatures soon were in the agonies of death. Husbands who had rushed from concealment to defend their wives had been cloven to the earth, Children ran shrieking to and fro, only to be dashed to pieces by the savages of the Missouri mountain. It was a carnival of lust and blood, over which the historian ever must dwell in horror. And yet those fiends in human shape were protected by the aegis of the Confederate flag. Such was the scene depicted by the messenger, when the division was halted, and a consultation took place. It was decided that while the main army went forward, two companies of infantry, a section of artillery, and a company of cavalry should be detached to proceed at once to Bohannon Mills, to protect the helpless families, and if possible to punish the rebel horde which had committed such awful crimes against humanity. End of chapter 7「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Recording by Andre Levy, Lisbon, Portugal. « Prisoner of the Mill » by Harry Hazelton Chapter 8 « Gone – The Signal Song » We must now take the reader back to Springfield. It was one week after the exposure and confinement of Walker, and something like a month before the army had commenced its retrograde movement, as described in the foregoing chapter. Walker, after the first paroxysm of his rage was over, settled himself down to think. Although he had shown a bold front at first, his final conviction drove from his heart all resolution and he evinced the most abject cowardice, the cowardice of conscious guilt, which makes the strongest tremble. But Walker was not a man to sit quietly in his cell and submit to his fate. 
His mind having been settled in the conviction that certain death would follow, he began to form his plans of action. To arrive at any definite conclusion was no easy matter, as he was chained and a double guard placed around his quarters. Yet he had hope. Time was given, and all might yet be right. He learned that he was not to be tried by a division court-martial, but would be removed to St. Louis in order that a general court might act upon his case. He also learned that it would be at least a month before the army would take up its march. Thus he had time, time precious to him, for like all shrewd villains he had his confederates, even in the army as well as out of it and to these he now looked for his bodily safety. It was the third night of his incarceration that, springing to his feet, he listened intently. There were three distinct taps on the door. "'The rescuers! The gang! I'm saved!' he muttered, as he gave three taps on the door in response. "'What's the word?' was asked from the outside. "'CSA and the bars!' answered Walker. And you? Good. Union against oppression. Tonight? asked Walker with eagerness. No. The pal on the other side ain't for union. Can't before day after tomorrow. Jim goes on, then. And though it ain't my turn, I think I can get pony number two drunk, and the job can be done. I'll try. Be cautious. Trust no one without the word. It was the neglect on my part, thinking it all right to demand the words, which brought me into this scrape. The rounds approached, and the sentinel was relieved. Nothing of importance transpired in camp for the next three days. An unusual quiet prevailed. It is true there was much talk upon the subject of the attempted murder, and many expressions of bitterness against Walker. Some even went so far as to suggest the hanging of that wretch before the army left Springfield, lest he should escape. None were more vehement than a repulsive-looking soldier known throughout camp as Ugly Jim. He stated that he had been on guard only a few nights before in front of the prisoner's quarters, and that he had every reason to believe Walker was trying to escape, adding that he wished he had been satisfied of the fact as he would have been glad of an opportunity to put a bullet through the murderous scoundrel. The party had been drinking freely, and had become exceedingly communicative. One of the soldiers, whose post was number one on guard duty that night, that is, in front of the prisoner's door, swore he would shoot Walker if he could find any pretext. "'You have no spite against him,' exclaimed Ugly Jim. "'And I have!' Let me take the matter in hand. I will stand your guard, and if the villain attempts to move, I'll riddle him, sure as Potosi lead mines. Enough said. I am on the second relief. I go on at seven and off at nine, again at twelve and off at two. This will be your time. Good. I shall be on hand. Ugly Jim then approached the tent of Miss Hayward, and requested an audience alone with that lady. It so happened that she was alone, Alabama having gone to visit her husband, and Sally being at the time strolling through the camp with Nettleton. "'If you wish to learn all the particulars about your brother, I think you can do so,' said Jim, in a tone of great kindness. "'Oh, in what manner?' asked Miss Hayward eagerly. "'I don't exactly know, but I will tell you what I do know.' You see, I am on guard tonight from twelve till two, over the cell of Walker. I don't like the villain, anyway, but he told me if I would get you to come to him, he would tell you all he knows of the matter. Certainly I will go. Call Alabama, and we will go together at once. I will, answered Jim, as he turned to depart. Then pausing, he added, uh, Miss Hayward. Now I recollect that Walker said you must come alone. He declared he would not commit himself by speaking before anyone. I dare not go alone. Poor child, exclaimed Jim as he wiped his eyes. Do you think you can be alone when this old soldier, as folks call Ugly Jim, is near you? 
I know my face is ugly, but I don't think my heart is. Besides, you won't see the wretch himself. You will only talk to him through a crack between the logs, and I shall be as close to you as Walker will allow. Of course, he won't let me hear what he says, but I shan't let you be out of my sight, so there will be no danger. Why can we not go at once? asked Miss Hayward. Because I don't go on post till twelve o'clock, and the other guard wouldn't let you speak to him. Then I will come at quarter past twelve, and I shall rely upon you for protection. You do that, miss, and I really think you do right. I know Walker is a very bad man, but he has got to die, and maybe he wants to make a confession to relieve his mind and to ask your pardon. And I always think it best to give a dying man a chance to relieve his mind and confess. You may expect me. Jim bowed and left the tent. Twelve o'clock came. The guard was relieved, and ugly Jim had taken the place of his sick friend in front of Walker's prison. All was quiet, save the clanking of a chain, a few hurried whispers, and the opening and closing of a heavy door, which sounds were in close proximity to Walker's dungeon. The words, CSA and bars, were answered by Union Against Oppression and two dark forms glided to concealment beside the thorn hedge, while the guard remained at the door. The evening dragged slowly along for Miss Hayward. A hundred times she had almost resolved to communicate to her friends the fact of her intended visit to Walker, and to ask their advice, and if need be, to request that someone should follow in the distance to lend assistance should any be required. But what had she to fear? Walker was secure in his cell, and one of the faithful guard had promised his protection. Besides, she had promised to go alone. If she did not, it would imply suspicion of an honest soldier. Walker might also ask if she had come entirely unattended, and how could she answer him? Miss Hayward was naturally timid, and by no means self-reliant. When the news of the supposed death of her brother reached her, she was almost paralyzed with grief. But now that hope had filled her heart, she began to nerve herself to the task of unremitting search, even though she must encounter the greatest dangers. The hour of twelve arrived. Closely muffled in a cloak, she crept from her tent and then paused to listen. She heard nothing save the slow and regular breathing of the sleepers and the violent beating of her own heart. She started, but her steps seemed to fail her, and she leaned against a tree for support. The thought of her dear brother and the probable unravelling of the mystery which surrounded his attempted assassination and his present fate gave her renewed courage, and she sped onward. In a few moments she had cleared the camp and arrived in the centre of the garden, where stood the doomed man's prison. As she neared the door, the guard asked, "'Is that you, Miss Hayward?' "'It is,' came the low response. "'Approach, and fear nothing.' She had barely reached the threshold when two forms, darting from beneath the hedge, threw a heavy blanket over her head, thus entirely smothering any attempt on her part to give the alarm. Who and what her captors were she could not divine, or what might be their purpose. Strange to say, her reason did not forsake her. She felt herself borne rapidly along, but not a word was spoken. It appeared to her that hours passed by, and she even longed to hear some word uttered which might give a clue to the intentions of those in whose power she was, or to throw some light upon the subject as to whom her captors were. The blanket, which was very heavy, almost causing suffocation, had been removed and a lighter one substituted. At length the parties halted, and seating themselves upon the ground, the covering was removed, and Miss Hayward was permitted to gaze around her. Her eyes first met those of Captain Walker. She shuddered and turned away. Then, glancing at his two companions, she at once recognized Ugly Jim and a person known in camp as Stupid Dick, both of whom had served as Union soldiers for a long time under Walker. As her eyes met those of Ugly Jim, she exclaimed, "'Oh, 
you will protect me. A laugh was the only reply. I trust Miss Hayward will permit me to become her protector, said Walker, in an assumed tone of kindness. Miss Hayward did not reply, but gazed around her. She was in a wild spot. She was seated beside a lovely stream of water in a deep valley, while high on either hand were ragged hills or mountains. She knew the country for at least ten or twelve miles from Springfield in all directions was quite level, and she judged she must be near the Ozark country, the first range of whose ridges she had frequently seen from that point. "'Does not the lovely Miss Hayward dine a reply to her most devoted lover?' asked Walker. "'What was your purpose in tearing me from my friends and conveying me here?' asked Miss Hayward. "'A pardonable one, I think. My life was forfeited in the Federal camp, and personal interest required me to uh, depart. I could not think of leaving without you, and so I resorted to a little stratagem. My love for you must plead my excuse. But I have told you, Captain Walker, that I could not love you. Do you suppose, after what has transpired, that I could entertain any other feeling toward you than detestation? I am aware of that. But when you know me better, I am sure you will consent to reward my devotion. I am going to convey you to your brother. Then I will thank you, at least, exclaimed Miss Hayward. Nothing else? She shuddered. I must be plain with you, continued Walker. I am not what I have seemed to be while with the Federals. I am a colonel in the Confederate Army, but I accepted a commission in the so-called Union Army that I might furnish information to my generals, or, if you like the term better, you may call me a spy. These two soldiers have been with me for the same purpose. And we are not alone. There are now in the Army of the Mississippi over three hundred privates and over twenty officers who pretend loyalty to the Federal cause. And I think when his sister has become the wife of Captain Walker or Colonel Brown, he may be induced to join us. Will you take me to my brother? On one condition, I will. And this condition? Miss Hayward... I love you with all the ardor of my soul. You have become necessary to my very existence, are a part of my life. When you spurned me, it drove me frantic, and I am so now. Beware, oh, beware how you turn this heart, which is yet pure so far as you are concerned, into a hell of furies. Pity me, oh, dear Miss Hayward, pity me. But my brother, what of him? I will tell you of your brother when you have answered my questions. Proceed, sir. Do not speak so coldly. I will be frank with you. Your brother is a prisoner, not in the Confederate camp, but in a secure place, on the very stream beside which you are now sitting. The murmuring and singing of these very waters will, or two hours, greet his ears with the same strain. Warble those strains to which I have so often listened while in camp, and which stirred my soul, and they will be borne direct to your brother's hearing, to relieve his brain, perhaps, from the insanity which now enchains him. Insanity, echoed Mammy. My brother's insane. He is a raving maniac, and but one thing can restore him. Oh, wretched, horrible news. What can I do to save my brother? You are the only person who can save him. Nor is the task a hard one. Only a few miles from here is a Confederate camp. A chaplain is in attendance. He will perform the ceremony which will make you irrevocably and securely mine. Go with me. Become my wife. And tomorrow I will take you to your brother, and we will not only restore his shackled feet to liberty, but his shattered senses to reason. We alone can do it. Can you assume the responsibility of a refusal? Miss Hayward remained silent for a few moments, and then gazed alternately at the three villains. An unnatural fire lit up her eyes. At length she said, Captain Walker, I do not know, but you are even now deceiving me. You may not know anything about where my brother is. 
ask these soldiers, replied Walker. Miss Hayward turned her eyes upon them. The captain speaks right, answered Jim. He does know where your brother is. He is crazy and is chained in that silence, commanded Walker. Do you believe, Miss Mammy? I must believe the worst, answered Miss Hayward. Soldiers, she added, turning to the soldiers, do you believe in the truth of Captain Walker's profession of love for me? I should like to think why not, replied Jim doggedly. Nobody could help loving you. Even I loves you, but I know it ain't no use, and so I don't say nothing. What have you to say? asked Mammy, turning to the other soldier. Lord, Miss Mammy, I always loved you, but stupid Dick never thinks of such as you, and so I acted mean just to spite. Gentlemen, cried Miss Hayward, springing to her feet, listen to me. You have wronged me deeply by aiding this wretched villain, your captain, to abduct me. I despise, loathe him, and sooner than become his wife, I would permit my brother to die as he is, for I know that he would curse me were I to save him at such a sacrifice. It will be but death, and I shall suffer very little, for my brother's pure soul will scarce have taken its flight, or mine will follow. Miss Hayward, silence, Captain Walker. Soldiers, you have human hearts, and this man has not. I appeal to you, save me. Find my brother, and return him safely, and I promise to pay you one thousand dollars each. If I fail to do this, I swear by the hope of heaven that I will become the wife of one of you, the choice to be decided by lots between you. These words acted like an electric shock upon the soldiers. They sprung to their feet and confronted Walker. But he had anticipated the effects of her words and stood sword and revolver in hand. "'You would play me false,' demanded Walker fiercely. "'Guess I would,' replied Jim. "'Take that, then,' yelled Walker. The report of a pistol echoed through the valley, and Jim fell without so much as a groan. "'And how do you decide?' asked Walker, turning and pointing his revolver toward Dick. "'I was only going to help you. I ain't no such foolish cuss as to think of marrying a fine lady like that. I'm all right. Prove yourself so, and you shall have your thousand. Deceive me, and you share his fate.' As Walker spoke, he stepped to a clump of thick bushes and drew a small boat from concealment. Handing Miss Hayward to a seat, and preceded by Dick, Walker entered, and the little craft swept gently along with the current down the stream. They had proceeded but a short distance when Miss Hayward burst forth and sung a wild, thrilling air, which echoed far and wide through the valley and across the hills. There was something strangely beautiful in her song, and something still more strange in her actions. As each strain echoed over the hills and gave back the ringing notes, she would start and listen attentively, and a gleam of joy would lighten up her pale face, upon which a shade of disappointment would almost as soon appear. Her hearers sat in silence and in apparent wonder. "'Those words are significant,' exclaimed Walker. What is their import? She's going mad, too, I opine, exclaimed Dick. Better let her go. Silence, cried Walker. Miss Hayward, do you think your voice will penetrate his retreat? She made no answer, but as the little boat swept onward, ever and anon the same words, and the same wild music broke the stillness of the forest, now sounding like a wail of sorrow, and then becoming almost hushed in hopeful expectation. The words had the appearance of being extemporized for the occasion, and were as follows. Break those fetters I am calling, listen only to my song. I am waiting, loved one, waiting, I have waited oh so long. Give but one fond word to cheer me, as I pray and hope and weep. Let thy echo say thou'rt near me, as my vigils thus I keep. Echo as along I glide this my song from thy retreat, and I'll bound to thy dear side. Are we ever again to meet? Yes, a seraph from on high whispers to me, thou art nigh. Friends are waiting, friends are near. Dearest brother, do not fear. 
End of chapter 8. Recording by Andre Levy, Lisbon, Portugal. Chapter 9 A Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christian Bilka. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter 9 The Pursuit. The Perilous Situation. Important Information. It was two o'clock in the morning, nearly two hours after Mrs. Hayward had been seized and borne from the camp by Walker and his confederates. The guard relief had commenced his rounds. The first post visited was that in front of the door where Walker had been confined. A glance revealed the prisoner's escape. The chain which had secured the door was lying upon the steps, and the door itself was slightly ajar. Walker and both the sentinels had disappeared. The long roll was at once beaten and the camp aroused. Scarce had the lines been formed when it was announced that Mrs. Hayward also had disappeared. The grief of her friends and the rage of the soldiers knew no bounds, and many was the oath of a terrible retribution uttered against the fiend who had spread such desolation and sorrow in her path. It was but a few moments before squads of cavalry were dashed in every direction in pursuit. There was but little doubt as to how the escape had been effected. The disappearance of the guard convinced all that they were in league with Walker, but in what manner they had gained possession of Miss Hayward was a mystery. No one had detected anything unusual in her manner the evening before, and she had retired at her usual hour. It was thought, however, that the parties would not have taken any main road, as the pickets would have given the alarm. They could not have had more than two hours to start, as everything was all right when the twelve o'clock relief went on post and at two o'clock the escape was discovered. If Walker had to walk through the fields in order to avoid the pickets, it would have taken at least two hours to clear them. It was most likely that once outside the lines, friends and horses would be procured. Still, the distance would not be so great that our horsemen hoped to overtake them, and so they set off with a good will in various directions. "'Are you not going to accompany us?' asked Lieutenant Wells of Nettleton who was seated on the ground, looking gloomy and sullen. "'Not by a darn sight,' answered Nettleton doggedly. "'And why not?' asked Wells. "'You go long and let me alone,' he answered sharply. There was no time for words, and the squadron departed. The night passed, during which Nettleton was bitter in his self-reproach for not watching closer, and would not hold conversation with any person. As the first dawn of the day became visible, Nettleton was seen crawling upon his hands and knees, in front of the former prison of Walker, and through the garden, toward the west. His movements were watched with considerable interest, as all had begun to respect him for his sagacity, in his peculiar way. At length he returned to his tent, and, without speaking, carefully examined his double-barrel shotgun, a beautiful piece which he had picked up upon the Wilson Creek battleground, and had been permitted to retain. This he loaded, then, taking a large artillery ammunition bag, he went directly to the tent of Adjunct Hinton. Removing the lid of a mini-ball ammunition box, he filled this pouch with cartridges. His next move was to place some provisions in his haversack. Then he started. "'Where are you going, William?' asked Mrs. Hinton. "'Them boots,' he replied, pointing in the direction he had just taken in his hands and knees examination. "'What do you mean?' why them boots as had two hearts on the soles went that way and i'm going to follow if i go to thunder he waited to hear no more or to speak more but bounded off to the westward he had been gone perhaps in an hour when fall leaf the indian scout already referred to entered the camp he was soon made aware of the state of things fall leaf was deeply attached to captain hayward and more especially so to his fair sister mamie the scout had been but a short time in camp when he had given to the general all the information he possessed with regard to the enemy. This done, he followed on the trail fast as possible. For several hours Nettleton kept on his course, now striking the main road for the purpose of searching for fresh tracks, then taking to the woods again to avoid observation. Several times he came upon the well-known footprints and a bitter exclamation would escape him. 
He kept his course, more from the judgment he had formed as to his direction Walker had taken, than from the numerous impressions of his boots. He was ascending a sharp and ragged hill, so heavily covered with the thorn bush and small scrub oak peculiar to that country, that his progress was rendered very difficult. Suddenly a figure darted in front of him and concealed itself among the thick undergrowth. Nettleton brought his gun to the shoulder and called out, "'None of that skulking, darn ye! Come out in fair fight!' Ugh, responded the voice, and Fall Leaf bounded to his side. Oh, it's you, is it, Mr. Injun? Well, I'm darn glad you've come, for you can hunt these snarly woods better than me. Any news? You kill em, eh? I shall kill em, if I only get a bead on the critter. You did kill em? Kill who? Dead soldier, there. Fall Leaf indicated that he meant further on. Come on, Injun said Nettleton. He reached the summit of the hill which overlooked the valley below, and, led by Fall Leaf, began its descent. They soon reached the stream, and the Indian pointed to the dead body. Nettleton gazed upon it a moment, and then said, Darn me if it ain't the very feller what run away last night. Walker has been here, sure. He commenced his search at once. He found footprints in the sand, and among them that of a lady, judging from its small size. The Indian had also been taking observations. Returning from a clump of bushes, he said to Nettleton, See, canoe, two, white bird, so. Here, Fall Leaf indicated by action that two men had drawn a boat from the concealment of the thicket, had entered it, as indicated by the tracks in the sand, and had proceeded downstream. Well, they've got rid of one scoundrel, anyway. It will only be man to man, and I feel myself to be a match for any dozen such skunks as that walker. They can't have much the start. Both Fall Leaf and Nettleton walked rapidly forward along the bank of the stream. At length, and it was almost a simultaneous movement of the part of each, they stopped and, bending forward, held their ears close to the ground. By thunder, cried Nettleton, that's her voice. White bird caged, she no sing, replied Fall Leaf. Ain't you a darn fool? Don't you know that White Bird, as you call her, has got a right to expect some of her friends will be after her, and so she sings that they may hear her voice echoing up and down among these hills, and know where to find her. Ugh, oh, good, white hunter, no fool. Again the voice was heard, and this time so clearly as to leave no doubt upon the mind of our hero as to who the singer was. Like a deer, he bounded off in the direction indicated. The music died away, and all was still but the two men paused not. Upon a sudden they emerged into an open field of about four acres, near the center of which were two large stacks of hay. The river at this point took a bend, and the two pursuers ducked directly across the open space. Just as they reached the stacks, Fall Leaf darted close in to the base of one of them, taking the attitude of a listener and making a significant sign to Nettleton. "'What is it?' asked Nettleton. "'Hark! Soldiers! Horses! Whoa! Hark!' Nettleton listened attentively, and then said, There may be a party of soldiers coming. It may be our men who have been in search of the miss, of White Bird, but it is well enough to keep close. It may be the rebels merely moving camp, and if this is so, Mamie must be with them. The sounds are coming nearer. Crawl under the hay, Redskin, way under, out of sight. This was effected with some difficulty, when a party of rebel guerrillas numbering about sixty, rode into the field, and proceeded to form their camp directly in the vicinity of the haystacks, under which the two men were concealed. "'Well, I guess we've got into the right shop,' said Nettleton to Fall Leaf. "'We are cooped up here close enough for a walk, but Miss Mame must be with this crowd. And, when dark comes, we can scout around and see what to do. Lay quiet, Injun. White Hunter knows. Make good Injun.' The day dragged slowly away. Toward night, a party of the rebels came for forage for their horses, but the hay was tumbled from the top of the stack, and our friends were not discovered. The guerrilla's conversation, however, was listened to with great interest by Nettleton. So Colonel Brown, or Walker, as he is called, came within one of being done for in the camp of the Yanks at Springfield. Yes, so he says. What the devil does he want with the gal? Oh, some love affair, of course. The gal was happy, for she was singing like a nightingale. Oh, yes. 
No doubt she was dazzled by the prospect of being a colonel's wife. Who is she? Don't know. My eyes, but she is a beauty. So much the better for him. Where was he going with her? Oh, below, taking her to her brother, I believe. Where is that? Down in the old mill. This was all the conversation heard by the adventurers, but the rebel troops did not move again until late in the next day, and our friends were compelled to remain quiet. They had learned sufficient to convince them that Miss Hayward was not with this band of rebels, but was being borne still further from them. They cursed the chance which had thus entrapped them, and prevented their overtaking the captive at once. Still, they resolved to keep up the pursuit, and they had learned that at some mill the lady was to be conveyed, and that her brother was there. Patiently they waited until they could emerge and finish their journey. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Prisoner of the Mill」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ahmed El Sharif Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton Chapter 10 Hayward It is time the reader was enlightened somewhat as to the fate of Captain Hayward. The wound he had received the night of the attempted assassination was severe but by no means fatal. The loss of blood had rendered him very weak, and for some time he remained insensible. At the moment the blow was inflicted, there was, upon the other bank of the river, and watching the Federals, a squad of rebel cavalry scouts. The water into which Hayward was thrown soon revived the wounded man. He was seen by this band and carried to the house of an officer of the Confederate army, not half a mile from the spot. Here his wound was dressed. It was not long before an order reached them, signed by Colonel Brown, to convey him to the camp of Colonel Price at Ozark. This order was low, and immediately after the Federals left Grand Prairie, a boat was procured and Hayward placed in it. But half conscious, he reached the Ozark Bridge at the critical juncture already described in the chapter referring to the interview between Nettie Morton and Charles Campbell and the interruption by Colonel Price, the rescue of Nitty by Fall Leaf, the approach of the Union forces, and the resolve of Charles Campbell to save the wounded captain. It was at the moment when Price was in pursuit of the Indian that Campbell, taking advantage of his absence and observing the approach of the Federals, hastily penned the note previously referred to and then pushed off with the boat down the stream in order to effect his escape with the prisoner. He began to hope that success would crown his efforts. The battle favored his flight. All that day and the night following, he pursued his course. It was his purpose to follow the gasconade until he had reached the point nearest Strolla, where he supposed he would be free from the roving bands of rebels who were so numerous in the vicinity of Springfield. But his hopes were doomed to disappointment. Colonel Price, anticipating the direction he had taken, immediately dispatched one Lieutenant Lewis, a most tireless wretch, with a squad of ten men to intercept Campbell and the prisoner captain. Just as the morning dawned, Campbell saw the pursuing party approaching. Pulling for the shore, he lifted Captain Hayward in his arms and bore him into a mill which stood near at hand. There he quickly concealed his charge in an upper loft and returned to meet the rebels. He stated he had been captured by a party of the Federals and conveyed to that point and that they had there released him upon his parole of honour. This story was generally believed, although one of the band appeared to be incredulous and left his fellows for a pretended search. Not observing his absence, the remainder of the rebel band returned without him, taking care, however, that Campbell was not left behind. When this person entered the mill, he found Haber leaning upon his elbow, quite conscious, but too weak to move. He perched before the wounded man and was silent. 
Hayward was so unrecognized him. Are friends near? was his feeble question. I am the only friend you have got in this part, and I reckon as how ugly Jim ain't just the man you want to see. You are one of my own men, returned Hayward. That's a bent as well admit of some argument. As the lawyers say, I may be your man when I'm in Springfield, but you are my man now, so don't kick up any fuss, and after I have made you fast, I'll tell you the rest. Ha <laughs> ha! He muttered to himself, but Walker shall pay me well for this. Saying this, the rebel rascal left the mill. Not far from this mill, in a rich log hut, lived an old woman who gloried in the title of Crazy Match, and of whom the rude backwoods people of the vicinity stood in fear, as it was almost universally believed among them that she was possessed of the devil. She told fortunes with great correctness, and employed the most singular modes in doing this, such as burning powder and strange incense, and the uttering of fearful imprecations and unearthly sounds. The mill was owned by one Bohannon, a captain of Confederate guerrillas. Since the commencement of the war, it had not been in operation except on rare occasions. About one mile above Bohannon's mill, there was another mill of smaller dimensions, which had formerly been owned by a thorough Union man, who, becoming a refugee, had abandoned this mill also. So when the residents in that region or any of the straggling rebel bands had occasion to grind their grain, they always went to the upper mill, more especially as it was believed that Crazy Madge had taken full possession of the lower one after its proprietor left and that being occupied in sacrilegious rites, it was very generally believed to be unsafe to venture in that vicinity. Even the most reckless and hardy of the guerrillas held the spot in oil and avoided it in all times. Madge was seated in her own doe when Campbell entered the mill with Hayward in his arms. She watched him closely but uttered no word. She saw him emerge and meet the rebel band. She watched their departure and then discovered the newcomer, Grouse Green, as he was known. When he came forth from the mill, Madge still was seated in the cabin doorway smoking her pipe. She did not even raise her eyes or pretend the least consciousness of his presence, until with a rude slap upon her shoulder, he said, Come, old woman, I want you. The old creatures pretended not the least surprise, but raising her snake-like eyes to those of the speaker, she said, Doth the son of Belial wish to know his fate? I need not the aid of my magic charms to point it out to me. In less than a month, the most horrible death. Bah, you old crone! I dash your brain out for a copper, you infernal croaking old buzzard. I don't come to have my fortune told, but I want you to serve me, and you shall have gold. Do you hear, old woman? No fooling now, and gold is yours. Gold, it is the master key to the human heart. And what am I to do for gold? My bidding. First, I want a set of chains. Have you such things in your infernal den? You can have them for gold, she exclaimed, tottering to a closet and rattling the cold iron. I always keep them, it is necessary to my trade. Now for the bargain, old hag. You saw me enter that mill just now. Well, there is a captain confined, or will be confined, before I leave him in the upper loft. He will be fastened, you must feed him daily, just enough to keep life in him. I will give you a hundred to start upon, more money than you ever saw, old woman, and when I return, if you have well done your duty as keeper, I will give you another hundred. Will you be faithful and keep the prisoner in safety from rescue? I swear it by my magic heart. Bah, blast your heart. Swear it by the gold you were received, and I'll believe you. But come. Green re-entered the mill, followed by old Matt. He seized the helpless Hayward and bore him to an upper loft. There he fettered him with the chains. And now I shall leave you here until we can attend to you at a more convenient time. 
he muttered as he gazed exultingly upon Hayward. He was about to leave him alone. Stay but a moment, cried the wounded man. Tell me of my sister. She has become the wife of Colonel Brown, of the Confederate Army, or, as you know him, Captain Walker of the Federals. Liar! cried Hayward. But no, I will not use such terms now. Do you know who struck the blow which so nearly deprived me of life? Yes, it is William Nettleton. He is also enlisted in the service of Walker. And I will tell you more. In two days after you disappeared, Lieutenant Wells was hung for your murder. Your sister flirted with Walker, who pretended the greatest friendship for her. I performed the ceremony, and tonight they are not three miles from you. Hayward had become insensible and sunk to the floor. Green saw this, and motioning to the old woman, they left him alone. That is the game I want you to play, said Green as they emerged from the mill. Of course, all I have told him is false, but I want you to carry it out, because Colonel Price wishes it as well as Walker, and as he is a most dangerous man to our cause, I don't care how poorly he gets along. It would be a good thing for us if he could never take the field again. So see that you do your duty. Madge received her money and agreed to follow all the instructions he had given her. Green now returned at once to the camp and reported to Walker. It was just before the decision of the court-martial had been given, and that officer was free not only from restraint, but from anything which had as yet assumed a definite form. He was delighted with the intelligence, and resolved to take advantage of it soon as Wells could be thoroughly crushed. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Prisoner of the Mill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter Eleven. The Prison. The Wheel Room. Caged. The Life and Death Struggle. We left Miss Hayward in the little boat, in the custody of Walker and stupid Dick. For several hours they sped rapidly onward with the stream. They encountered the party of rebels of which we have made mention, but as Walker, or Colonel Brown, was the officer highest in rank, no one attempted to interfere with his project. The boat kept its course until it came upon a broad flat which appeared to be some five or six miles in length, and perhaps one in breadth. This, Walker informed Miss Hayward, was the Valley of Bohannon. And, said he, your brother is confined in yonder mill. Miss Hayward gazed a moment upon the structure, and then burst forth in the same wild strain she had sung so frequently during her boat voyage. It is folly for you to attempt to attract his notice by your voice. He is a close prisoner and a maniac, and nothing but your constant presence and attention will ever cause his reason to return. "'What do you intend to do with him and myself?' asked Miss Hayward. "'I intend to take you to your brother. I intend to let you see him in a wretched garret, with no hope of recovery, or of even life, unless you come to his aid. I intend to permit you to gaze upon this scene, but not even to speak with your brother or to assist him in any manner, until you are my wife. Then you shall be free to attend to all his wants, to provide for his comfort, to restore him to reason, to life and to liberty. Miss Hayward bent her head upon her hands and wept. I will not ask for your final decision now, continued Walker. I will wait until you have seen your brother, which will be in a few minutes. The boat was drawn to the shore, and Walker, turning to Dick, said, I will dispense with you now. Go to Joe's farm. Follow my instructions as to storing the house with provisions, and at least one comfortable bed. Miss Hayward, it is a beautiful place of which I speak and, in case of your refusal to perform all that I wish voluntarily, or to save your brother, I shall be compelled to take advantage of a friend's mansion, in case I cannot effect my escape with you to Arkansas. This I doubt being able to do, and more I don't know that I shall run the risk, as I am only a subordinate, and some of my superiors might order your release. 
you perceive that I intend to make sure of my prize now that she is in my keeping. As my wife, she will be permitted all proper liberty. But until you are such, by your own voluntary act, I must keep you safely from approach by any one. Dick had left his master. Walker and Miss Hayward arrived at the log hut adjoining the mill and entered it. Old Madge was there, but she looked pale and frightened. "'Come here, Madge. What is the matter?' asked Walker. "'The devil's broke loose,' replied Madge, trembling violently. "'Come, don't be alarmed. I am Walker. I am the one who sent you the hundred dollars to keep the man safely. You have done so, I hope. He has just broken loose and run into the woods.' "'How did that happen?' Oh, he heard a voice singing outside, and in his fever delirium said it was an angel calling him to heaven, and he burst from his room and rushed up yonder. Walker and the old woman conversed together in undertones for a few moments, when he turned to Miss Hayward and said, Your brother, in his delirium, broke his chains, and is at large in the mountains. He will not return here, and I think it doubtful if I can find him. He will most likely make his way to the federal camps. But come with me, you shall see where he was confined, and then learn my further intentions. Walker seized the unresisting maiden by the arm, and drew her up into the mill. Up the dirty stairs she went, and finally entered the room, or attic, where the unfortunate brother had been detained prisoner. She shuddered as she gazed around her. Now, said Walker, I will show you your room, the one you shall occupy until you are Mrs. Colonel Brown. He drew her still further on, and opened a massive door which grated upon its hinges. She gazed in. It was a small apartment into which the carpenter usually entered when he wished to repair the great water-wheel which set the mill in motion. This room, or rather aperture, was of construction unlike any apartment intended for occupancy. There was a platform about ten feet in width, which formed the only flooring then a great opening beyond, through which the main wheel extended upward about eight or ten feet, entirely filling the opening in the floor. Any man confined in this apartment would find little difficulty in effecting his escape, provided he was an expert swimmer, and the mill not in motion. But the manner in which an escape must be effected would be as follows. When the mill was running, the wheel being then in motion, the water was thrown in large quantities in every part of the room, and its inmate could scarcely prevent drowning by catching his breath at intervals. To attempt to spring into the wheel, which was formed something like the wheel of a wagon, the rim or tire, however, being about twenty feet in breadth, with crevices or brackets for catching the water which propelled it, and the braces answering as spokes bearing proportion to the rim, would most assuredly be dashed in pieces in the attempt to gain the interior. But once there, he would be whirled around and round until he could gather his energies for a jump when that portion of the wheel in which he was perched was down, or nearest the bed of the stream. To leap out into the river would be a task equally perilous to that of springing in. When the wheel was not in motion, one could step into the opening, slide down the rim with great ease, spring into the water, and gain the shore in a moment. Miss Hayward gazed into this room or vault with a fainting, sickening sensation but she did not speak. It appeared as if hope had almost left her heart, now that she found her brother gone, and she nerved herself for any fate that might overtake her. It was, as we have stated, late in the afternoon before the rebels encamped around the stack where Nettleton and Fall Leaf were secreted, took their departure, and up to that time the two faithful pursuers were unable to venture forth. At last all was safe, and they emerged from their concealment and gazed around to them. No living person was to be seen. A meal was hastily prepared, after partaking of which they resumed their journey at a rapid rate. All night they plodded along, taking care to see that no mill was passed upon the route. As the morning dawned, they found themselves in an open space of considerable extent, and close by the stream was a mill. This was carefully examined in every nook and corner, but nothing was found. They made inquiry of a woman living in a cabin near the spot, and learned that, a mile further on, was another mill of larger dimensions, belonging to one Bohannon. For this place they immediately bent their steps. Arriving, they were met by old Madge, who immediately commenced her mummeries in order to divert their attention. The Indian gazed upon her a moment, as if half in awe and half in fear, but Nettleton did not pause and exclaimed, "'Come along, Injun. I expect here's the place.' They entered the mill. 
the indian remained at the door to prevent any egress while nettleton commenced his search up and down high and low the search was prosecuted walker being then within had observed the approach of nettleton and the indian his first impulse was to fire upon them but he knew if his aim proved inaccurate he might then bid adieu to life and so he resolved to resort to stratagem he seized miss hayward and sprung into a wheat bin close by the door of the wheel room we have described he soon buried himself and his prisoner among a lot of old bags husks and refuse and cautioned her to remain quiet as a band of kansas cutthroats who regarded neither the life or the person of a pretty woman were at hand this had the effect to keep miss hayward quiet nettleton had completed his search the lower floor of the mill had been carefully scrutinized its closets its bins except the small one near the wheel room which had escaped his notice i wonder if there's anything under the mill queried nettleton i'll call and see if that does any good captain captain hayward the voice was at once recognized by miss hayward who vainly struggled to reply but walker had a handkerchief so tightly over her mouth that she could produce no sound at length by a desperate effort she removed his hand and shrieked here william here where where cried william as he sprung toward the bin in the wheel room yelled walker smothering his voice so far as to drown the exact direction in which it came nettleton bounded into the wheel room closely followed by the indian who now supposed their friends to be found quick as lightning walker sprung from the bin and slammed the door upon them bolting it securely he then started for the mill gate which being hoisted would set the large wheel in motion as soon as the door was closed upon nettleton he rightly suspected treachery and throwing himself with all his violence against the door tried to force it but in vain quick injun jump into the mill wheel and down into the water they were about to adopt this plan of escape when the wheel started with great rapidity rendering it seemingly impossible to do so now yelled walker as he seized miss mamie and bore her from the mill you shall see the folly of opposing me you shall see how i triumph over all obstacles and how those who oppose me perish inside of the mill and near the door was a quantity of hay and unthreshed grain stored there for use by some neighboring farmer or gorilla striking a match walker lit the inflammable material in a moment it blazed high and communicated with the woodwork walker only waited to see this and then almost dragging miss hayward along he reached the river drew the boat into the stream and was once more floating with the current look miss mamie is not that a lovely sight he cried pointing to the mill now thoroughly enveloped in flames nettleton is there and fall leaf is there and they have been brought there by you they will perish in those flames and you must be responsible for their murder when will you learn that it is useless to oppose me and cease to do so to submit to my proper and honorable requests is the only way you can save your friends when nettleton and fall leaf found their mode of escape thus cut off they naturally turned to each other for advice the water thrown from the wheel so blinded and choked them that they could not hold conversation at all it was not long before our prisoners became aware of the fact that however disagreeable the water might be they were likely to be visited by an element and that very soon far more disagreeable under the present circumstances the flames were seizing upon every part of the mill and all around them soon became a mass of lurid destroying light the rafters flooring and upper work threatened to fall at any moment still the room in which our friends were confined remained unscathed surrounded as it was by water but it must soon yield to the fiery element the wheel still moved yet it seemed as if its speed was somewhat lessened at length nettleton yelled injun i'm going take your chances with a bound he sprung into the wheel he escaped any severe blow but upon alighting he was tossed and pitched and tumbled over until at last catching upon the center bar he held himself until he had made his calculation as to where his next jump should be at last he ventured the hazardous leap and was precipitated into the foaming waters beneath the wheel which in its revolution struck him lightly calling forth a grumble or a grunt but nettleton battled bravely with the rushing waters and at length half dead with suffocation he crawled upon the bank as the burning rafters of the mill were falling around him well i suppose injun is roasted alive and i must do the work alone i'm darn sorry and i've lost my gum too but i ought to be glad that i didn't lose myself the villain 
but won't I roast him if ever I lay these hands on him? Thus he muttered as he sat for a moment gazing upon the appalling spectacle before him. He then sprung up and seeing the old woman at once started for the cabin. Madge met him at the door. Will you have my services to tell you truly the fortune that is in store for you? She asked. Your services? Yes. I'll have you tell me all about affairs here in this quarter, and if you don't own up everything, I'll put you in this pile of logs and roast you, as sure as you are a she-woman. Do you understand? I have but little to reveal of the circumstances to which you refer. The Federal officer was in the mill a prisoner, but escaped in his delirium, and is now somewhere out in the mountain. Walker and the lady were in the mill, but are now out of reach downstream. This is all I know. And it is enough. Now you just fork over a good minier musket. I know you have a dozen concealed here for the use of your friends, and all the fixins for settling the hash of your friend Captain Walker, for him and me has an account to fix that will require powder and lead, if this bread-cutter of mine don't do the job, he said, handling his bowie knife. Madge only too well read in Nettleton's face the resolute nature of the man, and with scarcely a moment's hesitancy went out of the hut to a hollow tree nearby, and produced from thence an arm full of arms, made up of shotguns, old-fashioned rifles, and a minier musket. From these Nettleton selected, after careful scrutiny, a heavy double-barrel squirrel gun. Ammunition was also supplied by the woman without hesitancy, and the pursuer soon found himself equipped in a most formidable manner. There, old gal, you have done the right thing. It is well that you did, for, sure as lizards, I should have burned you in your pen if you hadn't forked over what I knowed was in your possession. Now good-bye, and behave yourself. If the captain, my captain, I mean, comes back to you, do you be kind to him, for I tell you it is for your best interest to be so. Do you believe that? I believe anything you say, replied the old creature, betraying her anxiety to get rid of her visitor. You do, eh? Well, just keep on thinking so, for I shall, mayhap, want to use you again some of these days. So good-bye, and keep your eyes clean. With this injunction he started again for the river, following the stream for some distance, but finally, for some reason best known to himself, he took to the mountains. Every few moments he would pause and listen, as if a faint sound met his ears, and then continue his journey. After Nettleton had escaped from the mill, Fall Leaf began to look around for some other means of escape. He felt sure that Nettleton's leap must be a fatal one, that, if he was not dashed to pieces by the wheel, he would certainly be drowned in the rushing waters. All chance of escape for the poor Indian appeared quite as hopeless. The flames were already hissing around him and curling up the sides of his prison house. The fire had weakened the boards, and, just as the flames were coiling around his form, he made a desperate effort, and burst the siding from the mill. In an instant he sprung through the aperture, although the fiery element presented a formidable obstacle between himself and safety. He alighted, however, with only a few slight bruises, and, waiting for nothing, bounded forward. He knew if Walker had continued his journey down the river, he could soon overtake him. For an hour he did not slacken his pace, and finally, in turning a short bend in the river, he beheld the boat. He was about to dash forward to the rescue of Miss Hayward, but he remembered that he had no gun, his only weapon being his sheath-knife, while Walker was well armed. He must resort to stratagem. His object was to watch for opportunity, and when Walker should land, or when the boat neared the shore, and the thicket favored the moment, to spring upon him suddenly and drive the knife to his heart. But the river gradually grew wider, and Walker kept his boat in the center, too far distant from the shore for any attempt for his seizure to prove successful. All that day and all the night following, the boat drifted on with the stream. It was evident Walker was anxious to reach a certain point as quickly as possible. The morning dawned just as the little craft shot past the ford on the Rolla Turnpike, near the Ghost Swamp, a locality of weird interest and novel character. Walker was about to land near a small farmhouse which stood behind a jutting hill, entirely concealed from the main road, but, before touching the shore, his quick eye caught sight of a dark form creeping cautiously along the bank. At the same moment he discovered three horses tied in a thicket only a short distance from the house. Whether they belonged to friend or foe he could not tell, but the fact of seeing the creeping form rendered him cautious, and he immediately pulled for the opposite shore where he landed. "'Are you friend or foe to the Confederates?' shouted Walker from the opposite side of the stream. There was no response. "'That cursed dick must have betrayed me,' he muttered. "'But I will match them yet. Come.' He dragged Miss Hayward along up the mountain steep. 
At length he reached a point of rock which extended far over the valley below. A narrow footway, not more than ten inches in width, forming a kind of shelf in the rock, led into an immense cavern which is known in that region as the Silver Cave. Just in front of this cave was a large flat rock forming an overhanging platform, but to reach this, or the mouth of the cave, required great care, as the narrow path was the only manner in which an entrance or exit could be effected. Into this place Walker conveyed Miss Hayward. Walker had, when meeting the rebels two days before, provided his boat well with provisions. These he conveyed with him into the cavern. He had not observed, however, that he was followed closely, and that the Indian arrived at the narrow passageway just as the rebel and his prisoner entered the cave. This was so. The Indian crept up as closely as possible and peered over the projecting point which shut Walker from his view. He was observed. "'And who are you?' yelled Walker. The Indian was perfectly familiar with the cave. He knew no person could leave it by the narrow shelf or pathway. He could keep himself concealed, and if Walker passed a certain point, before he could bring his gun to bear, he could strike him dead. Walker was a prisoner, with a watchful and relentless keeper. The Indian replied, "'Ah, white bird! Fall-leaf here! Fall-leaf save!' "'Is it indeed my friend, Fall-leaf?' cried Miss Hayward, joyfully. "'Yes, Fall-leaf save you!' "'Where is William Nettleton?' asked Mamie. "'Gone, gone!' "'Ah, then I have only you to encounter,' yelled Walker. "'And if the fates favor me, I shall triumph. "'I know the Indian has not thought to provide himself with provisions. "'I have enough to last us with care for two weeks, "'and by that time he will starve, "'for no Federal fool ever will find me here. "'He dare not leave in search of help, "'for I shall then effect my escape. "'So we will play our hands, "'and see if I do not hold the trump card. "'Ha, ha! I can baffle any friend you have, Miss Hayward.' "'White birds sing,' said the Indian. "'Yes, I will sing, and as we are now near the main road, some one will be sure to hear me. "'Me watch, me wait.' During the entire passage Miss Hayward had not failed to sing her echo song every few miles, hoping to attract attention and gain assistance. Now that she was so near the public highway, she applied herself anew to the task. Walker made frequent attempts to silence her, but could not do it, as he feared, whenever he turned from his watch, that the Indian would dart in upon him. Some two years previous there was a superstitious belief prevailing in that section of Missouri that the spirit of a murdered lady appeared upon the waters of the Gasconade, singing her mournful lays and gliding in her death skiff along the waters. For some time past nothing had been heard of the lady ghost, but when the songs of Miss Hayward were heard, the simple inhabitants began to think that the ghost lady had returned and instead of seeking to gratify their curiosity, were careful to keep as far as possible away. So it proved with regard to the cave, after the singing commenced. Several days passed, and no succor appeared. The Indian kept faithful watch, and so did Walker, that he might not be taken by surprise. Walker, becoming convinced that Fall Leaf had no gun, several times endeavored to bring his own to bear upon his vigilant foe, but this he could not do without placing himself in a dangerous position. Both were weary for want of sleep, and both would occasionally sink into a fitful slumber. But so intent was each upon his object, that the slightest movement would rouse the sleepers, and each stand ready to meet his foe. But as Fall Leaf had no food, he began to grow faint. His firm frame began visibly to weaken. Still, he determined to maintain his watch as long as life should last. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Prisoner of the Mill》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christian Bilka. Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter Twelve The Mountain Adventure. Let us return to the army, which we left near Lebanon. The main force was to continue its march onward towards Rolla while a battalion of infantry, a section of artillery, and a company of cavalry struck to the west of the main road, and started for the point from which the messenger had arrived. It was a weary march, as the troops already had proceeded twenty miles that day, but the dreadful atrocities related as having been committed by the guerrillas fired the hearts of the brave soldiers, and they pressed forward with a will. The troops at last reached the scene of the outrages, in the place known as Bohannon Mills Valley, 
The deeds of blood and horror had not been exaggerated by the messenger. Women had been murdered in their beds. Old men were lying stiff and cold, with their brains beaten out, and children, helpless and weeping, were clinging to their dead bodies or wandering distractedly around. The battalion which had been sent to this value was the one to which Lieutenant Wells and Adjutant Hinton belonged. Wells was still suffering from the terrible anxiety of mind which he had recently undergone, but did not permit his own troubles to interfere with his discharge of duty. The troops camped in the little valley to collect the scattered families whose remaining members it was determined to take along with the army in its retreat. Soon word was brought by a mountaineer that the guerrillas still were infesting the mountain while the flames of a burning mill seen below seemed to give evidence that the miscreants still were at their work of blood. This decided the officers to scour the mountain, if possible, to force the rebels to a fight, for there was not a man in the Union ranks who did not pant for a chance to meet those dastards, who, under the protecting folds of the Confederate flag, committed atrocities at which humanity stood aghast. Wells was soon at the head of a strong party of dismounted dragoons, and with them struck off for the hills back of the burning mill a weary march was brought to a sudden halt by a deep water gully over which no perceptible ford offered a passage up and down it wells passed to reconnoitre it was an ugly spot to be caught in by a willy foe and the troops were so disposed as to guard against a surprise the men kept close under cover of the dense undergrowth so as not to betray their position should the guerrillas come upon them lieutenant wells and adjunct hinton were proceeding up the watercourse when a rattle of firearms arrested their attention it was evident some kind of a conflict was taking place over the stream the volley was not however answered by a return only a single shot was heard and then a wild frenzied shout as if of maddened men after a brief interval another shot was heard and a second paralyzed howl was followed by shouts and curses plainly heard by the two anxious senior officers it must be the guerrillas after the poor unionists who have fled to the mountain said hinton our men must not be idle when such work is going on you stay here wells to watch further while i go back to bring up our boys hinton hurried away while wells crept forward to the very edge of the deep but narrow gully beyond which the sound of conflict were heard hardly had he secured a spot for observation ere he was startled by the crash of the undergrowth and the voices of men not ten rods away on toward the lieutenant's place of concealment came the pursued and pursuers the first was but a single man whom wells several times detected gliding from tree to tree keeping under cover like an experienced woodsman he was closely pursued by a band of guerrillas all dismounted who were making the hills echo with their demonic yells slowly the fugitive retired holding the foes at bay by his sagacious maneuvers wells became intently excited over the scene and resolved to rush at once to the brave fellow's aid but there lay before him an impassable gulf over which few men could bound finally the hunted man struck the gully and saw at a glance that his retreat was cut off the enemy saw it too for they set up a shout of commingled derision and pleasure which so maddened the fugitive that he yelled laugh away you dark skunks i'll make more than one of your dirty carcasses food for the crows before i go under and suiting the words to action he fired two successive shots from what apparently was a double-barreled fowling piece two of the gorillas must have fallen for ferocious shrieks of agony followed wells could endure no more there stood before him his brave friend william nettleton hunted by a dozen fiends who must soon overpower him if aid was not quickly given he started backward for a couple of rods then rushed with almost flying swiftness up to the gully and bounded over its sharply cut edge for a moment his desperate leap arrested all attention nettleton deemed it a new adversary coming upon him from an unexpected quarter and turned knife in hand to close in with his antagonist what was his astonishment to welcome lieutenant wells into his arms what a shout followed the guerrillas quickly sought cover not knowing how many others might be lurking on the opposite side of the ravine to give them a bloody welcome wells by the jumping jingo where did you come from and where is you going to go give us your hand and lend us your revolver ah got two of em array down on your knees quicker than lightning 
for the women murderers are after us. Sharp! Down the two men fell, just in time to escape a volley from the carbines of a squad of the murderers. With the dexterity of a squirrel, Nettleton rushed forward to a friendly tree, and fired quickly three shots from the revolver. It was a surprise to the enemy, for two of their number fell. So true had the aim been. The squad retreated to reload, but Nettleton had no idea of permitting that, and was about to press his advantage when a powerfully built rebel came rushing upon him, knife in hand, from the right side of the tree, unseen by the undaunted man until it was too late for the use of his firearm. In a moment they were clasped in the death struggle. Three or four of the guerrillas rushed to the spot, only to be shot down by Wells' deliberate aim. No more appeared and the two combatants were left for their fearful work. Each had seized the knife hand of the other, then followed the strain of muscle for the mastery. The gorilla, counting upon his tremendous strength, doubtless hoped for an easy victory, but in that ungaining form he found a bundle of nerves tough as whalebone, a human frame elastic as Indian rubber, but as invincible as steel. Down toward the gully the combatants pressed, in vain did the rebel try to force his antagonist to the earth. The supple form of Nettleton bent under the adversary's pressure, but his frame at length rebounded with a force which bore the gorilla to his knees. He drew the Federal down with him, and on their knees the frightful combat was continued. Wells would have advanced from his concealment to the rescue, but knew that a rebel carbine would surely bring him down, and thus place it out of his power to aid his friend at all. Slowly toward the chasm the men worked their way, struggling like two serpents striving for the death triumph. It was an exciting but appalling spectacle, which the sudden roar of firearms on the left did not serve to arrest. A shout followed, which Rells recognized as that of his own men, who must have discovered a crossing below, and have come upon the band of cutthroats unawares. There was a sudden scattering of those concealed in the immediate vicinity of the hand-to-hand -hand contest, but one villain rushed from his cover upon the writhing forms of the bleeding men with the design of dispatching the unconquered federal wells was upon him like a tiger and in a moment cut him down with his sword hinton beheld the stroke and came rushing up to the spot just in time to behold the struggling men go over the gully's bank together the two officers hurried to the bank some twenty feet below they could distinguish the forms of the combatants both apparently lifeless Without a moment's hesitancy, Wells dropped from the brink and fell crashing through the dense jungle lining the water's edge to the bed of the stream. He was stunned but not injured, and arose to his feet to find Nettleton in a sitting posture. Beside him lay the big gorilla, silent in death. "'I'll be danged if that wasn't the ugliest cuss I've ever tussled with. Breeches holt. Back holt or rough and tumble.' This was his first ejaculation. Are you injured? anxiously inquired Wells. Well, let's take a reconnoitre. There's a hole in this arm that spilled the only good coat I've ever had, dang it. There's a rip, too, in the collar. Where well, the critter's knife tried to cut my windpipe. He did scratch me thar, I believe, he said, fingering his neck down which the blood flowed freely. By Gemini, if I hadn't lost a finger, he added, suddenly holding up his hand. Now it's too bad. If it's on the left hand, I rather think the Reb got a mouthful when he chewed that off, and thus he would have continued for another ten minutes had not shouts from above aroused him. Who's come? he asked. Hinton and the battalion. Glory! And have the Rebs been caught in a trap? I don't know how many, but from the shouts and shouts I don't think many will be permitted to escape. All right, now just give us a lift to see if my shanks is all right. There, that's the juniper. Just look at my back and see if you find any holes that won't plug in. No holes were found, and the good-natured fellow came out of the combat with only flesh wounds, save the loss of one finger from the left hand, which the gorilla had bitten off. Nettleton was much exhausted, and was finally drawn up out of the gully with no little difficulty, when the men set up a shout which made the hills ring. There, boys, that'll pay for the bruises. And now I guess you'll have to do me another favor. Just rub my shanks and the hinges in my back with a little whiskey, if you can spare it. In a moment, a dozen pocket flasks were produced, and willing hands gave him a good rubbing, which gave his limbs new strength. It was evident that his muscles had been severely overtasked, for he was languid and incapable of exertion. 
Nettleton now narrated the particular of his and Fall Leaf's adventures. Soon the troops were out on the search for Captain Hayward, while, assisted by a couple of comrades, the wounded hero of the hour made his way down to the cabin of old Madge. The old creature received him kindly and at once bestirred herself to make him strong again. The air was soon odoriferous with the smell of distilling herbs. A prolonged shout, ere long, came rolling down the hill. Nettleton was aroused from a sleep into which he had fallen. His two comrades at once hurried out to ascertain its cause. Old Madge paused in her toil and said, The captain's found, I suppose. Hooray! yelled the invalid, now an invalid no longer. Springing from his bed, he rushed out, and away he went up the hill in the direction of the still-continuing noise. His companions, astonished at his sudden recovery, followed, and all were soon lost to sight. Harry Hayward was indeed found, and the cavalcade, bearing him on a rude litter, after a half-hour's time, made its appearance coming down the mountain. Nettleton was at his side, crying like a baby. Wells held the sick man's hand while his face, still expressing anxiety, beamed with joy. Hayward was discovered hidden in a quiet, cool nook, where he lay in a very exhausted condition. He had, in this fevered delirium, broken away from Madge's custody, but no sooner was he out in the cool shade of the trees and rocks than his mind became clear and composed. Weak and ill as he was, he still had strength to seek a place of safety from pursuit, should it be attempted, as he supposed it would be. At nightfall he had determined to seek out some respectable-looking farmhouse, and on the morrow to cast himself upon the mercy of strangers, knowing that even though that stranger might be a foe, he could not be more inhuman than men wearing the uniform of Confederate officers. But the sufferer was spared further efforts. The shouts and reports of firearms Hayward distinctly heard, and at once surmised that a Union force was at hand. When the men scattered in squads for the search through the mountain, the captain beheld one of the parties passing before his hiding place. It was his moment of deliverance. He stepped out before the astonished soldiers, who, not recognizing the apparition, did not at once welcome him. My men, don't you know me? Captain Hayward! they shouted, as they rushed upon him and clasped him in their arms. He was borne toward Madge's cabin, to be welcomed on the way by the gathering men. Wells now appeared. The joy of that meeting can be surmised. The welkin was made to the ring with the glad notes of the jubilant soldiers. These notes it was which aroused the sleeper in the cabin, and when at length he appeared, struggling wearily up the hill, the cavalcade paused to permit the overjoyed parties a few minutes of undisturbed greeting. Nettleton was not even talkative, a circumstance indicative of the depth of his feeling, and it was not until the captain was fully domiciled in the cabin that he could even consent to talk of the past and its painful incidents. He then narrated the events of Walker's plot, as we have here recorded them, ending with the tragedy of the mill. It was a revelation of intense but most painful interest to the sick man. But he bore the affliction of his sister's loss with great resolution, sustained by the conviction that he who doth all things well would not permit the evil one to triumph. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of Prisoner of the Mill》This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christian Vilka. — Prisoner of the Mill by Harry Hazelton. — Chapter Thirteen — The Cave and the Contest for Life After two days spent in the cabin, Nettleton became excessively uneasy. From something which had transpired, he conceived that old mage knew more of Walker's whereabouts than she had yet confessed. This conviction, once formed, was but the prelude to action. Without informing any one of his purpose, he followed the old woman into the woods, whither she went in pursuit of her medicaments, having in his hand a stout rope. In a wild, retired spot, he confronted her. Look here, old critter, your closed mouth when it would be better for your health to talk a little. Now ye just tell me where Cap'n Walker has taken Miss Mamie. Talk straight, and not a gap in the fence. I don't know where he has gone, she answered rather evasively. 
that is, you are a natural born know nothing. Well, it will assist your memory, perhaps, to stretch your neck a little. Just to take the kinks out, you know. So pass your shock toe into this air noose while I pull you up on that limb. And suiting the action to the word, he flung the noose dexterously over her head. She was taken by surprise, and trembling in every limb, asked, Would you hang me? Sartin as there's a tree, and here's a rope. I don't know where Walker is, but I think he has a place of refuge down the river, near the ghost swamp. There's a cave in the river's bank, opposite of the swamp, where I know his confederates occasionally secret themselves. He may have gone there, but as he has been gone over two days, I don't see why I should be there now. It's my opinion, however, that Miss Mamie, as you call her, is there, as it is the best place to keep her. Ah, thank you, old Miss Crowsfoot. There's something more on your mind, isn't there? Madge looked at him inquiringly. I know all about your friend's visit, so do you just play your cards right, or I'll catch you niggin. This allusion to her friend startled the old woman. He was no friend of mine. He came along on his own account, and I only gave him bread, as I will give any one who is hungry. All right, only what did he tell you? She hesitated. Nettleton gave the rope a twitch and looked up at the limb. The hint was enough. The man said he was up from below on a scout. He was anxious to know what I knew about the voice of a woman, which he said he had heard all along the river. He heard it distinctly as he passed the road along the river by the ghost swamp. Others had heard it, and he believed that I could tell him something as to its meaning. I told him it was a sign that he was singled out for death, that every person who heard it was called, and he might, therefore, make up his mind that his time was come. With that he left. I did not inform him of who was in my cabin, nor anything about what had happened here. So I hope you will let me go, and frighten me no more. Nettleton slowly lifted the noose from her neck and, without another word, walked back to the cabin. He called out Lieutenant Wells, who was then watching at the captain's bedside, and the two friends held a long consultation together, which ended by an order for a guard of twenty to be ready for a night expedition. By ten o'clock all were in readiness and on their way, taking the river path downstream. Wells was in command. Nettleton acted as a scout and guide. All night long they pressed on, and daylight found them on the hills opposite the spot indicated by Madge as the locality of the cave in the bank. Asking Wells for his field glass, Nettleton carefully scrutinized the river bank opposite. After a short survey, he suddenly exclaimed, The engine is sure as Sacramento! What did you say? inquired Wells. Fall leaf, see him? There he lays, and there is the cave. I'm blessed if I know what to make of it. I suppose, of course, that that red skin was roasted alive in the mill. But there he is, and here I goes. So saying, down he dashed into the river and forded its waters rapidly. Once on the opposite side, he hurried up the bank and soon reached the ledge across which the Indian was lying. The poor fellow was but half conscious from over fatigue and hunger, yet his eyes were fixed with cat like vigilance upon the aperture of the cave while his hand still firmly clasped the knife upon which he relied to do his deadly work. Nettleton approached him silently and touched his feet. At once the Indian looked behind him. Give Fall Leaf drink, quick, was his hurried whisper, while the finger on his lip indicated silence. Nettleton comprehended at a glance, passing his canteen and knapsack to Fall Leaf. He beheld the Indian drink and eat with satisfaction. Not a word passed between them. Good! Fall leaf, much weak, now strong again, he whispered. Where's Miss Mamie? The Indian pointed to the cavern. Walker, too? Fall leaf nodded and scowled so fiercely that Nettleton perceived the savage wanted no interference in his case. Shan't I do the job for you? No, Fall leaf mad. Me kill him. You go away. That's the talk, Injun. You shall have your man, but Jerusalem, don't I ache to get my paws on him. A noise was now heard in the cave. It was Walker's voice. I'll not permit you to sing, I again tell you. If those men crossing the river are Union soldiers, you shall not betray our whereabouts, and if Fall Leaf moves, I'll shoot him. 
Bah, you ornery cuss, I'm on your track now, shouted Nettleton. William, dear William, cried the captive woman, recognizing his voice. Here, he responded, and so chock full of the devil that if I don't get rid of it soon, it will spile me. Walker, you dirty beast, dare you fight me? he yelled. I dare fight any decent antagonist, but don't care to dirty my hands with you, was the reply. Oh, you nasty, miserable, thieving woman stealer, man assassinator! I'll cook your breakfast for you, but Fallleaf shall eat it. He'll dirty his hands with you. I defy you and all your crew, growled the rebel. If one of you dares to show your head, you are a dead man. Blast your pitcher! Here's a head! Shoot it! cried Nettleton, sticking his head out in a manner to dare Walker's fire. The scoundrel was prepared and discharged his gun in an instant. Its report had not ceased its echo ere Fall Leaf, with a bound like a panther, dropped before the entrance of the hole. Walker stood there with knife in hand to foil any such attempt to storm his castle. A quick blow with his foot sent the Indian headlong over the ledge. Try that on me, roared Nettleton, who, uninjured by the ball from Walker's musket, was at the Indian's heels. No sooner said than done, and Nettleton received an unexpected blow in the bowels from the rebel's heavy boot which sent him almost instantly over the edge after Fall Leaf. That was the propitious moment for escape. Without a word to his captive, he passed out upon the ledge, and had nearly reached his terminus when Lieutenant Wells, followed by his men, confronted the desperate man. Drawing his revolver, Wells cried, Surrender, or you're a dead man. I will never surrender to you, was the fierce reply, as the now-cornered desperado began slowly to retire, backward to regain his stronghold. He had retreated fully halfway to the entrance when his heel caught on the rough floor of the ledge, and his balance was lost. For a moment he sought to regain his foothold, but, finding it gone, he gave a shout and leapt over the precipice. The soldier looked over the ledge and saw his form disappear in the trees beneath. Wells did not wait, but rushed to the cavern mouth. Miss Mamie! A form darkened the passage, and within stood Miss Hayward, smiling and blushing as if just caught at her toilet. With a cry of joy, Wells entered and clasped her to his bosom. Safe and uninjured! Thank God! Thank God! answered the maiden. Safe and restored, and, thank God, your brother, too, is recovered, and is now in our hands doing well. Then I am happy indeed, she could only reply while tears of joy checked further utterance. Wells had entirely forgotten Walker in his moment of sweet communion with his restored friend, but a shout which came up from the depths below recalled him to duty. It was a wild Indian war whoop, then a succession of ejaculations which the men could plainly distinguish. Go in, Injun. Walk along, Walker, you darn skunk you. There, that's a good un engine. Now another in the corn rib. There he goes. Hooray for the engine. All well knew the meaning of this, and a number of the men hastened to the base of the cliff by a long roundabout path, which came up from the river to the ford below. They arrived to find Walker slain and Fall Leaf badly cut in the face, arms, and shoulder, but no serious wounds on the body. Nettleton stood over his friend, bathing his wounds in the clear water of the river. Engine's done for the cutthroat, sure. It was mean to shut me out, but it was his game, cause he treated. I'd give all I'll ever be worth. Would you give Sally? put in one of the men. Dang, Sally. No. Dang my skin, that is. Dang me if I wouldn't give my commission, boys. That's it. Give my commission to have had the satisfaction of doing Fall Leaf's work. Nettleton looked savagely at the body of the dead man, seeming to feel that he had made a personal sacrifice in permitting the Indian to kill his enemy. It would appear that both Fall Leaf and Nettleton, when kicked off the ledge, fell at its foot without injury, as the base was banked up to a considerable distance with the decayed and water soaked debris of the bank, down which they had rolled into the water. They had recovered, and stepped out into the stream to look up to the ledge, when they beheld Wells and Walker confronted. In a moment the rebel staggered, and went bounding off the ledge, and, like his two antagonists, came tumbling and sliding down the declivity, landing at the water's brink upon his feet. 
There he was received by the Indian, with the wild whoop which startled those above. Nettleton, in honor bound not to interfere, stood by while the two fierce foes closed in deadly conflict. Walker, though a resolute and strong man, was not equal in a knife fight to the supple savage. After a few passes, Fall Leaf buried his knife in the rebel's bosom. Thus closed the career of a bad man, bad by nature, but rendered doubly bad by the cause which he espoused. To serve that cause he had to betray his country, desert his friends, stifle the voice of conscience, perjure his honor, become a hypocrite and a deceiver. After that, all other degrees of crime were easy. Wells followed the men at length and appeared on the spot. He was shocked at the sight before him, but conceded its justice. His own wish was to have secured Walker for trial and punishment according to military law, yet it must be acknowledged that, many times, he felt like wrecking condign personal vengeance on the head of the man who had wrought so successfully in crime. He ordered the body to be buried in the debris at the foot of the cliff, and there repose today, with no monument save the cave above, which will long remain as a witness to the traitor's crime and traitor's doom. End of chapter 13「Prisoner of Mill」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. From Prisoner of Mill by Harry Hazelton. Chapter 14 The Bodyguard's Sickness and Cure. Slowly the party wended its way back to the mill. Just at nightfall it came in sight of the lonely hut which covered the treasure so dear to the heart of the rescued maiden. How her eager arms longed to clasp her brother's form to her bosom, how her ears longed for the sound of his voice. The wings of the swallow would have been slow for her pining soul, but the moment of reunion came at last. The dead was made alive, the lost restored. Miss Hayward, gallanted by Wells, pressed on ahead of the troop, and their panting steeds at length stood riderless before the cabin door, for the riders had disappeared within. The meeting of brother and sister was one of mingled pleasure and pain. Both had suffered so much that to think of it was pain. Captain Hayward was greatly emaciated. Loss of blood, fever, hunger, and exposure would have ended a life less tenacious than his. But despite his suffering, the presence of friends, the rescue of his sister, the anticipated happiness of her reunion with the man who had proven himself so well worthy of her, all conspired to give an elasticity to his spirits more potent than the infusions of herbs prepared by the not unskilled hands of old Maggie, who, from an enemy, had by the force of couldn't help herself, as Needleton declared, become a useful instrument at a critical moment. And what about Needleton? All day long after the morning's experience at the cave, he had plodded on soberly, somewhat absorbed in his own reflections. Behind him sat Folliff, who from his weak state was well content to ride. The Indian, though perfectly silent and apparently indifferent to all things, now that his work was done, still was inwardly pleased at the rescue of the thought of the pleasure in store for the captain of whose safety he had been informed by Needleton, and he was quite willing to go into camp for a few days before putting out again on his endless scouts. Needle be sick, at, he at length asked his companion. Not by a darn sight, Injun. Needle be sick, Foliff knows it. You be danged to the nation, you red onion head of Delaware, was the somewhat excited answer, 
as he turned into the saddle and stared in the Indian in the face. Foliff smiled. Needle one physic. Miss Long give needle physic, he obstinately persisted. Now look here, Miss Injun. If you want to fight, just you say so. I'll be cat a wumps it if I don't lick your wuss nigger what's got a mad woman after him. For leave no one to fight Nido. Maybe whip Nido. Then what Miss Long say? Yo ho, you mean sneaking son of a brickling. If you don't stop that clapper in your head, I'll be switched if I don't put a peg through it. And he set his face firmly to the front, rolled his horse severely with the his spurs, and dashed ahead at a speed quite uncomfortable to the provoking Delaware. When the cavalcade reached the cabin, Needleton did not obtrude himself upon the party within. For an hour or more, they were alone. At length, Hayward asked, Where is my brave preserver? Why is he not here to enjoy our happiness? And fall leaf too. I would thank him as he deserves the noble and devoted savage. Search was made. Fall leaf was found out by the campfire, undergoing the process of lotion cure for his wounds, at the hands of Maggie, who was carefully washing the bruised and cut flesh of the red man. All inquiries for Needleton were fruitless. He was not to be found. It was ascertained at length that his horse also was gone. Many were the surmises as to the cause of his absence, and fears were expressed for his safety. Morning came, and the party, now rejoined by the entire battalion, prepared to move by easy stage from the valley toward the line of march pursued by the retreating army. Captain Hayward was made quite comfortable in a camp wagon with his sister for companion and nurse. Foliff pushed out far ahead to scout and secure the command from surprise. Adjutant Hilton and Wells were tireless in their devotion to the comfort and safety of their charge. It was a pleasant journey, that week of slow progress toward Tipton. At length, however, the village hove in sight. The white ants dotting the hills and valleys proved that the division was there. While yet a long way off, a party of horsemen accompanied by ladies was seen dashing off at full speed toward the spot where the battalion had halted for its noon bee-walk. Wells caught his sight of the party, and with his glass made out the gaunt form of Nidoton far in advance. Behind him, on the same horse, rode a female, whose identity the officer could not fix. Nearer and nearer the horsemen came, until after an exciting race they dashed into the camp, Nidoton and Sally Long. They were received with a wild hajay from the entire troop, and none shouted louder than Nidoton himself. Hooray, hooray, by the eternal jingo, he cried, leaping from the horse, and leaving Miss Sally sitting there alone, before the eyes of the joyous and excited troops. Making his way to the captain's marquee, as the man had named the wagon, he was welcomed by Hayward in a manner which quickly turned his servant's joy to mourning, for the embrace of real affection bestowed quite upset Needlestone's confidence. I'm nothing but a great darn skunk, anyhow, he exclaimed as, breaking away from the captain's embrace, he started for his horse and the neglected Sally. Nettle be sick! He turned to behold Fallif gazing upon him in mock compassion. Not by a dangerous sight, you infernal lamp of glory, he now shouted as clasping the Indian in his arms, gave the red man a hug which brought forth a grunt. <laughs> Nettle make Foliff sick. 
guess nettle got full of miss sally now yes sir and there she is in all her glory was the rejoinder as the boy guard pointed in the evident pride to the smiling woman gentlemen of the jury let me present to you my wife the dangest no the most blissful woman you ever saw your wife exclaimed a dozen voices at once yes my wife hitched to me tighters a handle to the jug by chaplain disbro two year, days ago by the eternal jingle this was enough for the man all order gave way before the hilarious uproar fall which followed they pressed around sally to offer their congratulations which the delighted wife received with great good nature and dignity still sitting where she had been left behind the saddle on the horse at this moment the party first described rode up it was composed of mrs hinton miss morton and a number of friends eager to welcome the captain and his sister of whose fortunes Nitterton had most unexpectedly three days before brought the news to camp that it was a joyful meeting may well be assumed does not our story here end to say that miss mamie hayward soon became mrs wells in the presence of the whole division that the grand gala day followed is but half the truth however for at the same time another bridegroom was there in the form of the pale but happy captain henry hayward who took to be his comforter and his much-needed nurse the woman who loved him most truly miss nettie morton it was indeed a most happy consummation of a drama which promised at one time to end only in sorrow and broken hearts now the least happened of all that throng nor the least noted was nettleton the captain's bodyguard end of chapter fourteen end of prisoner of the mill by harry hazelton